Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 14, 2016. This is the week in charts. This week's week in charts is brought to you by Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters. www.barkingsquirrelcoffee.com. I can attest to the fact that the coffee is quite excellent. Craig's a client of mine. He's also a good guy. So check it out. I had the dried Ethiopian yesterday. Uh, air dried, I guess is what it's called. It's actually dried in Africa before it ships over. So it's just phenomenal coffee. And I would be having a cup right now doing the show, but I don't want to get too jacked up. And it's also brought to you by me, of course. I guess I need to update my graphic. Uh, I kind of like this graphic, though. Anyway, uh, my trading service, you can find that on my website or go to tradingservice.com. We'll talk a little bit about that later, too. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading or, as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. Eh, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, based on your request, I thought now might be a good time to go back in and talk about stops. And there's three things you need to ask yourself when it comes to setting stops. How long do you want to be in a position? How volatile is the underlying instrument? And, of course, where would you obviously be wrong? Now, I'm going to kind of introduce and touch upon one and two, but today's focus is going to be mostly on the third one here. And I have some videos out there on the other two. If you can't wait, uh, a lot of today's presentation and uh, next week's is taken from these uh, original videos that I did on stop setting. And if you go to videos on my website and I just added these two this morning so scroll down so you get the how to videos and then these are the two weekend charts 129.15 and 2.515 so a little little bit over a year ago I did that and you're going to see a lot of those things in today's presentations and next week's plus plus I'm going to expand upon that a little bit now again I just want to touch upon one and two. First question you need to ask yourself is how long do you want to be in a position? The longer you're in a position, the larger your stop has to be. Obviously, if you're scalping intraday, which I'd recommend you don't do, but you could have a very, very tight stop. But the longer you're in a position, the more that position has or can move. Okay. In fact, big moves really take time to develop, and that's why we take this hybrid approach where we look to get in for a swing trade and then stay with the trade for hopefully a long, long time and convert that swing trade into a longer term position. So the other question you need to ask yourself is how volatile is the underlying instrument? I do want to touch upon volatility a little bit today, too. And then again, we'll cover it in more detail next week. So the more volatile stock is and the longer you plan on being in the stock, the combination of the two helps to you to determine where that stop should be set. So we're trying to get a swing trade out, and let's define a swing trade as between one and ten days, between one day and two weeks. Somewhere in that period we want to get paid. But – we're not going to slot ourselves as only swing trades because we like to have an open-ended aspect to our trades. By the way, that's very crucial in trading. You have to have a methodology where your losses are somewhat limited. Something bad could always happen, but somewhat limited. And your potential gains are unlimited. And the reason you need that unlimited is because that someone limited sometimes becomes a little bit more. In other words, something bad would still happen. And I'm going to touch upon that in just one second. So the volatility, you must be outside the normal volatility for the time frame you, you're looking to stay with the stock. So you have to be able to withstand the normal volatility. So that means your stop has to be out side of that shorter term normal volatility so if you want to hang on for like I said somewhere between one day and two weeks to hopefully get a nice little move out you need to really figure out 
where that stop should be to be outside of that normal volatility. Now, one thing you need to remember is that a tight stop at a less volatile stock is not necessarily less risky. So a lot of people think, oh, Dave, I can't trade those wild and crazy volatile stocks. Well, I firmly believe it's better the devil you know. And I'm pretty sure if you go in, if you go to my store and scroll down to free reports, I make you walk through the gift shop first, like the well, anywhere you ever go, tourist wise, to get to it. But if you do scroll down to the bottom, DaveLander.com slash store, you'll see free reports. If you click on free reports, there's uh, a report or two or an article or two that I did on volatility. So I'd encourage you to read those. This is a slide I took uh, possibly from those aforementioned webinars. I don't remember the exact stock, but I think it was a relatively new issue. And the share price was $44 a share. And I determined that it needed about an eight-point stop based on the volatility of the stock. But for argument's sake and illustrative purposes, let's assume – that we were using a smaller stop on the position because the volatility was lower, okay? So if you go in and use a one-point stop using the 2% risk formula, okay, and when you divide it out by one point, that means you'd have to buy 2,000 shares of the stock. Like I said earlier, if a stock is really that low in volatility, then you're going to have to put on more shares to make trading it worthwhile. So you put on just a few shares in a non-volatile stock. Well, that's, I hate to use the word, dead money, because I often say, don't worry about dead money. I don't want to confuse that lesson. But it's pretty much dead money because you're not going to make enough to make it worthwhile. And something bad obviously can always happen. But the point I'm trying to make today is, if you did try to buy 2,000 shares of a $44 stock, then you've got $88,000 if you're trading a 100K account. Then 88% of your account is in one stock. So you have nearly all of your account in one stock. And let's say something really bad happens overnight. The stock gets halved. CEO does something he's not supposed to be doing, okay? Gets uh, caught in bed with a dead hooker or a live boy, you know? <laughs> something like that. And unfortunately, it happens, okay? And if it does happen, the stock gets halved overnight, or their drug, God forbid, kills people, or a lot of bad things can happen, okay? then you're out half of your account or nearly half of your account. Now, let's say you're trading one of these Big Dave volatile stocks, and Big Dave says, hey, we need about an eight-point stop to withstand the normal volatility, the normal short-term volatility of this stock because we're trying to get a swing trade in and then hopefully have that trade turn into a longer-term trade. By the way, the secret of trading, this is why I use the hybrid money management approach, and I can't wait to get done with some of these projects that I'm working on so I could get to, to do a money management course. It probably would sell about two because nobody cares about money management, right? <laughs> but I think it's necessary nonetheless. And money management, position management is, is just as important as the other two pillars of trading, which are obviously the methodology. You need the methodology. And number two, the mindset, the psychology, the trading psychology. You must have the proper mindset to follow the methodology. Anyway, before I digress too far, so say I determined that we need an eight-point stop, okay? Well, you would only buy 250 shares of this stock for every 100K, or if you had a, a 100K account, you would only buy 250 shares because that's 2%, 2,000 divided by eight equals 250, okay? Um, I might have this spreadsheet laying around. If you guys want it, let me know. I'll see if I can dig it up. 
Uh, oh, you know what I could do? I could just give you the portfolio snapshot, and that gives you that gives you all these calculations. So if you want, you guys want that, just ask me for it. So now we have 11% of the account in this one stock. Now, it's a volatile stock. Something bad could happen. Better the devil you know. Okay? So let's say something bad happens. And this stock gets halved overnight. Well, it's going to suck. But you're going to live to fight another day. You'll lose 5.5% of your account, which you can survive that. It sucks, okay? And every now and then something really bad happens in trading. And that's why money management is so crucial. It's like almost I stop myself short from saying, the methodology is the most important part, because, but because I want to talk a little bit about the importance of stock selection in a few minutes, and I think the methodology is the most important part, but that doesn't matter because sometimes, as we talked last week, sometimes, and not all times, but sometimes I'll be printing money in a service, and people who are, who are following along or claim to be following along are losing their ass. Well, why is that? Well, that's because... They don't have the proper mindset to follow the methodology. Not that we always print money. Obviously, there will be losses. Today, we're talking about stops. Stops, we have to use stops because sometimes there will be losses. But anyway, the point here is that you can't trick yourself into believing that a less volatile stock is less risky because in order to make the math work, you would have to put on more shares. And that's the whole point here. Okay? So read the article where I discuss... Better the devil you know. Okay. So I thought it'd be a good idea to look at the stops at the open portfolio because that gives us a wonderful example of how the stops must be adjusted based on the volatility of the underlying instrument. So if we're looking at some of the stocks in here. Now, this is a bank, and volatility tends to be a little bit lower on a bank. So we ended up only using about an 8% stop on this particular bank, okay? But if you look at some of the other ones in here, notice that these numbers are nearly 30 and above 30% for the stop. And that's simply what it called for. Now, they're lower price, and that kind of skews it a little bit. But it does make a big difference, okay? So I've had people in the past, when they start trading the service, or looking at the service at least, or even looking at my webinars, they go, well, 30-something percent stop? I can't, do, I can't use no 30-something percent stop, right? Well, then you ain't getting no coca. That's a scene from Caddyshack. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that. But uh, it was 50 cents for a Coke. Yeah, Lou, Lou's losing at the track. He raised the price of Cokes. I ain't paying no 50 cents for no Coke. Well, then you ain't getting no Coke. All right? Now, what am I trying to say? Well, I just pulled one out of the portfolio that had uh, one of the bigger stops. And this is CNX. It's an open trade right now. So the entry was here, and the stop was actually 34% away. Now, that sounds crazy. 34%, Dave, that's ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, right? Well, if you eyeball the stock, that stop doesn't look that far away, okay? And notice that the stock did move 34% in our favor. And as of yesterday, it was up about 50%, 49 point something based on the close. But it was up over 50% intraday. So if you're, not going, if you're not willing to trade a more volatile stock, then you're not going to get these 50% and possibly 100% or 500% moves out of a stock. You're going to sit in a sleepy little stock for a long, long time and hope that nothing bad happens to you. Now, 
Any questions on Capiche? <laughs> Capiche. Hey. Any questions? Anything so far? So the focus, one thing I wanted to focus mostly on today before we get into possibly statistics, which I'm really not going to get that heavily into next week, but I do want to kind of touch upon statistics, especially like historic volatility. And I know everybody's ATR crazy, so I, I, I have to figure out how to address ATR. That's one reason that I put that off till next week, because I wasn't sure how to address ATR, average true range. And the question is always, hey, Dave, do you use average true range? It's like, no, but if you boil it all down, I probably am using some sort of average true range, but I just prefer to use my my brain and look at the stocks and kind of eyeball it. And I'll come back to that in one second. But before we do that, let's talk about the third thing I had listed. Where would the position be a failure? So one of the patterns that I like to trade is the first pullback after a base breakout. Now, I'm not trying to buy that breakout or breakdown out of a range, but if it does break out nicely from a range, if it stocks in a trading range or any other market and begins to take off out of that range, then I'm like, okay, well, show me. Prove it to me that you're a worthwhile position. So what I do is I wait for that first pullback, and if that trend begins to resume and triggers me in, then I look to get long. Now, whenever you enter a position, whenever you get long, ask yourself, where could you be wrong? Well, obviously, if it pulls all the way back into the prior base, okay, you're going to be wrong there. Now, depending on the distance that the stock moves above the base, you may have your stop somewhere above the base or Sometimes you might actually put it back in the base because sometimes a stock will come down and kiss the base goodbye. So an obvious place is either just above the base or maybe back in the base a little bit, depending on the volatility of the stock, how far it broke out, etc. But without splitting hairs too much, you know if the stock returns all the way back to the base, that something's wrong. And maybe you need to exit the stock because notice that I purposely drew a little sideways arrow in here because the stock has gone sideways here. And then we broke out, but if it returns back to the base, we're back to going sideways again. So that's something to think about. Now, let's say you have a first thrust setup, a transitional setup where... You know, transitional setups are a little bit less accurate, a little harder to trade, a little bit. I get more questions on transitional setups or emerging trend setups than all of my other patterns combined. But there is one advantage. Well, there's two advantages to them. One, there's a chance to get on a new trend early, and that's the that's the only reason we go after them. But two is once you get on board, the good news is the stops can be fairly obvious or at least the area where you're wrong can be fairly obvious. So if you're looking to get in a first thrust, and a first thrust is simply a sharp run from lows or highs, as we saw recently, and then you're looking to get in on that first pullback. So let's say you do trigger an entry, and I forgot to draw my little dotted line. If it comes all the way back to the old lows, then you know maybe it's going to go and make a double bottom, triple bottom, or maybe it's going to just resume its longer-term downtrend. Okay. Now, depending on how far this is away based on the volatility of the stock, then your stock could either be all the way down at the old lows or maybe just above those old lows because if it makes it all the way to here, then it's possible the position is failing. But we know if it goes all the way to here, then this little arrow we drew, draw, we drew, we drew, draw, this little arrow we drew, draw, is no longer, and I did a crappy job drawing it, is no longer in effect, okay? And maybe the longer-term downtrend is just resuming, okay? And that's trading transitions. I don't go off on a tangent too much. Imagine that, me on a tangent. 
But when you're trading transitions, you are a bit of a pioneer. And like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the arrows or the gold. Well, in a case like this, you get the big arrow and you're back. Now, let's say you're trading something like a first thrust off of highs or a gatekeeper off of highs. Same sort of thing. If it triggers as a short and then it turns around and goes on to make new highs, then you know you're wrong. In some cases, depending on the setup, especially like a gatekeeper, where the pullback is really sharp and very close to the old highs, then you could put a setup way up, you could put your stop way up here. Now, you're no longer a trend follower if it makes it all the way to near this stop, but sometimes you would just write, but early. Michael, that's the same thing. That's uh you guys see the big short if you haven't, you gotta watch it. Um just don't watch it with someone who doesn't know markets because you'll drive you'll drive them crazy explaining to them what's going on because they'll be scratching their head, look at you, and then you'll start saying, Well, a derivative of a collateralized mortgage. <laughs> anyway, before I digress too far. But sometimes if you have that stop way up here, you know you're wrong up here, but maybe the position will come up here and get dangerously close, and then it makes a double top, and then it dies. So you're just a little right, but early. Okay. Now, same thing on something like a more gradual setup. Let's say you have a stock that just kind of comes down and bases for a long time, and then eventually makes a bow tie pattern begins to take off. You get triggered in. Well, again, like the first thrust here, or like this case on the short side, if it goes on to make new lows, then maybe this longer term trend is still in effect, okay? So without knowing anything about statistics, you could look at the actual patterns. Is it returning? If it returns to a base, you're wrong. If it makes new lows and you're long, you're wrong. If it makes new highs and you're short, you're wrong, okay, with these transitional patterns. Now, this is the tough one here, and this is where the statistics and, and all these other things tend to come in. If you're trading, let's say, a generic pullback, well, sometimes you get triggered in and the stock rolls back over because the correction is not over, and then it takes off. So you never really know for sure where that stop could be. And again, maybe we'll cover this in a little bit more detail next week. But one thing you could look at is the depth of the pullback. Maybe this market is so oversold that it's due to bounce back, and maybe your stop could be fairly tight uh, considering the volatility of the stock, okay? Uh, also, let's say you have something like a, like a TKO, for instance. If you have a really sharp TKO move and your entry's here, maybe your stop could go right below that low because if it triggers in, and it goes all the way back down, takes out that low, then that's a failed pattern. So where would the pattern fail? You have to ask yourself, okay? Uh, no audio. No, the audio's fine. Uh, I, I'm seeing it on my end. So sometimes a, a, a squirrel gets his nuts caught in the wires or something. When he's moving his nuts around, he gets them caught. So um, the recording will have audio. But thanks for the heads up. All right, any questions on any of these things so far? Craig says his nuts are fine. Craig is uh, from BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. Thanks for the update on that, Craig. Okay. Now, uh, these are some examples that I that was able to find from those uh, prior presentations. That's a little too much information, Craig. Uh, this was sort of a gatekeeper, I guess you'd call this, in the dollar yen from a while back. And notice that it triggered in. It didn't drop right away, but then it kind of began to work its way lower in here. So in a case like this, kind of a you call it a deep first thrust, call it a gatekeeper. Uh, to those of you who are trained in classical technical analysis, it's a pretty good. It's a pretty good looking head and shoulders. I don't want to digress too far. Imagine that. I don't use classical technical analysis as direct timing, but I use it in my timing. In other words, I look for a gatekeeper, a first thrust, a bow tie, 
or some other pattern that I trade, and then I look for confirmation in something like a head and shoulders. Nothing wrong with classical technical analysis, but I think you're better off, it doesn't have to be my setups, but you're better off with some sort of setup and trigger in place. In other words, a first thrust or a bow tie or something that's a little bit easier to recognize, even though my patterns are somewhat subjective, but it's a lot less subjective than the classical technical analysis. But you'll find that gatekeepers and bow ties and first thrusts and other patterns will set up with a bigger picture of classical technical analysis type of patterns. So in this particular case, you can see that the stop above the old highs is not that far away. It's very tiny. If this is the mother of all tops, and this thing's going to go way down here, then so what? This little risk is minuscule compared to bigger picture. So if you do take a trade that looks like this, you could put in a stop at brand new highs, okay? And if it goes up there and hits it, you know what? You're wrong. And here it comes. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. You know, it's all fun and games until someone loses a nut. <laughs> there was a, uh, I like the um, Life is Good shirt where the guys are standing around the campfire with uh, with their um, wieners on a stick and they're roasting the wieners. And then one guy's like all sad because his wiener fell in the fire. <laughs> and it says, uh, it's all it's all fun and games until someone loses a wiener. So that's a, that's a pretty good, um, that's a cute shirt. Craig, you need to make some bark and squirrel shirts. I'll, I'll probably wear one. All right, uh, another example, and this one was actually a losing trade. <gasps> Shocking! Did some did did a guru just admit that he has a losing trade? Of course I do. I have plenty of them. Okay, if I never had any, you'd never see my fat ass again. How's that? Uh, this was last year. It looked like oil was bottoming out. This is USO. This is oil. It looked pretty good to me because we had a nice little thrust from lows. I actually showed this uh, in real time, and we had a little bit of a pullback. Now, this thing went up a little bit, worked out initially, but then it came down and stopped out. That's not my point. My point is that if it returns to its old lows, then you know something's wrong. And I think our stop was right around here. So there's two schools of thought. One, you could trade fewer shares and say, okay, I want to – I only want to get out if I'm absolutely, positively, completely wrong. So that means that you would put the stop in below the old lows. And if you're feeling a little bit more traderish and thinking, well, here's the thing. If it gets close to those lows, it's close enough for me to admit the position's a failure. So I'll trade a few more shares and use a tighter stop. Or I'll trade less shares and lose a much looser stop. Now, I'm kind of skirting accidentally or backing into accidentally a little psychology here. And you're just going to have to figure that part out on your own. I, I don't have a problem with using a loose stop way down here because this tells me that I'm really, really wrong. Okay. My, my, uh, looking smart wants to have a stop up here. I want to look smart, but I don't have a problem with using a stop way down here because I want to be, with the transitional pattern at least, I want to be absolutely positively proven wrong on this because sometimes these markets will take off. They'll have a quick drop back to the lows and they'll take off again. And that can be frustrating. So if this isn't, if the old lows aren't too far away, Kind of like in that prior example, I think that's this is where my stop was in this particular one, if memory serves. And I'm getting kind of old now. It's hard to remember these things. But I think it was up at brand new highs, so I didn't have to worry about it so much. Okay. Now, a few things we'll talk about, I just want to kind of touch upon. And then again, we'll, we'll come beat this dead horse more next week and then... Everybody's into statistics. I mean, I kind of feel like statistics are worthless, and 74.3% of all people know that. But we will touch upon those statistics next week. Um, common sense is your best friend. Eyeball it. If it's bouncing around three and four and five points a day, then your stop has to be outside of that normal volatility. Don't overthink it. And I find that, that's one of the biggest problems that I see is a lot of people just try to overthink things. Um, 
just ask yourself, number one, where would you be wrong? And number two, this stock is bouncing around so many points a day. It, it moved so many points over the last week. Where would my stop have to be to where, number one, I'm wrong, and number two would be outside or slightly outside of that normal volatility? Uh, sometimes the depth of the pullback can be can be telling because you can get into a pullback situation where you've got a deep pullback to where it's a, it's it's almost to a point of failure. And so if you did get into the stock and it got much below that deep pullback, then it would be it would suggest that the position is a failure. Okay, so you still would want to give it some room, but in a case like a deep deep pullback. Maybe you can go a little bit tighter on a stop. Uh, a textbook TKO, like we said earlier, sometimes you get the big knockout move to where if this stock comes all the way down here after triggering, then something might be wrong with the stock. Okay, TKO is like a big shot across the bow, scares everyone out, knocks people out. I mean, that's the whole idea. You want to knock people out. You want the market to knock people out. Those same people could could wreak havoc on you if you were already in a trade. In fact, that's my litmus test a lot of times for the TKO pattern is if I was actually in the stock or imagine myself actually in the stock, would I have been stopped out? And those of you who've been in a service longer term, it doesn't happen often. I can only think of maybe one example the last five years, but they're, 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 they have been a few over the last 10 to 15 years. But every dollar did, you'll get stopped out of a stock. And then you'll see me recommend the same stock the next day. That will have a move like that. We'll be long from way back here. We get stopped out. So long and thanks for all the fish. This is our stop. We get knocked out. And next day, guess what? Or that night, hey, fellas, let's get back in this thing because it looks pretty good, if and only if it triggers. And we've only had a few of these over the last, like I said, 5, 10, 15 years. But it does occasionally happen. Now, also ask yourself, what's the least amount of room I could give this position and, and have it still work? So there's a fine line between too loose and too tight, obviously. And if you use the statistics properly, that stop is going to be huge, okay? So you got to figure out a way to maybe get it somewhat a little bit inside of those statistics. And, and, and I almost even hate to get into the statistics because that just kind of muddies the waters quite a bit. But if you're looking at the true statistics, proper statistics, I should say, then that stop is going to have to be really, really wide to, to withstand the, the move of the market. So you need to ask yourself, what's the least amount I can give this position and still have it work? Now, his, the other thing, too, is, is the HV super high? We'll talk about historical volatility next week. But just to kind of let you know, on some of those aforementioned positions, I think the HV was in the triple digits. Now, I do get a little nervous once that HV, you know, you could have too much of a good thing. Once the HV, historical volatility, is just a statistical measurement of volatility. Once that 50-day historical volatility, or as some people call it, statistical volatility, gets into the triple digits, then you know the stock is crazy volatile. And, and there was one coming into today and yesterday that I like a lot, but the HV is like 170, 180 on it. And it's just when it gets that crazy, you really need to think twice about whether or not you should take that position. So if the HV is up towards the triple digits, then try to figure out where you think your stop should be. But then remember that, statistically that stock's kind of crazy so it might require an even bigger stop than what you determine okay so it's kind of like it's kind of like just the opposite of what i said a second ago about how tight could you go with your stop you kind of do just the opposite with a very volatile stock based on historical volatility you say okay well i've got to, i need to start with a super wide stop and then try to take that down a little bit to a small as you could get that, it still survived the volatility of that stock. So hopefully that made sense. We'll beat the dead horse on this a little bit more next week. Wouldn't they call this a failed retest of previous high, a.k.a. a lower high? Yeah, if your stop is, let's say you got a short, 
I probably shouldn't have digressed to, to answer this question, but I, I should have answered it in a, later. Um, but yeah, if you're short a position, let's say you short it, uh, let's say, let me redraw this. Let's say you short a position here and your stop is here, then yeah, that would be a failed retest if it doesn't get to that. And then you survived a, a double top or something like that. Uh, am I answering the question? I don't know if I'm answering the question. Uh, Sherry says, awesome class, but missed the first 30 minutes. Is it recorded? Absolutely, Sherry. Uh, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll get it as soon as it posts. And uh, shortly thereafter, I put it under videos on my website. Okay. Now, if you're getting stopped out a lot, and I tell the story over and over again, and it happened twice that I can remember. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think one was 19 and one was 21. Somebody got stopped out 19 times in a row, and somebody got stopped out 21 times in a row. These were two phone calls that I specifically remember. But I seem to remember going way back in time where people called me up 10, 11, 12, 13 stops in a row. Anyway, people call me up getting stopped out a lot. There's two things you're doing wrong. One or two things or some combination thereof. Number one, your stops are too tight. I fixed a lot of people by telling them, just loosen up your stops a little bit. Reduce your share size. And by the way, I don't know if I made a, a strong enough point about the you don't get no Coke. The market movement has nothing to do with your feelings. And it's kind of like it's kind of like Craig and I were talking. Craig trains dogs. He sells coffee and trains dogs. And he trades stocks. <laughs> so he's uh, he, his life stays interesting. He's always got something going on. And Craig and I were talking, and we got to talking about trading psychology last week. And he was saying that most dogs have – a, a certain type of, um, I don't know if the, the temperament's the word or whatever, but the, the, the most dogs are like a common denominator. They There's a little differences here and there, but they all tend to act in a certain way. So when you go to train a dog, there's certain things you do. The problem is the owner. And I've heard, as Craig said, and I think some other dog trainers have said before, you're not really training the dog, you're training the owner. So your reaction, what's the common denominator? The market. The market's going to do what the market's going to do. It's your reaction to that and your feelings towards that. Oh, I can't trade a stock that that's volatile, that, that is that volatile, he tried to say. Well, then you can't trade that stock. So before I digress too far, I know too late. The second part of that getting stopped out a lot is your stock selection might need a little improvement. And again, this is a, an older slide, but soft sell. You avoid just one bad trade and you paid for the course and then some. And then if you get one more good trade, then you've paid for the course many times over. So if you go to my website and store stock selection course, I'm feeling generous today. So if you get the course, I'll give you a year of my trading service. That way you could see what I say in theory, but then see it in reality. That in reality part doesn't happen much in this business. And I, boy, I, <laughs> I don't want to piss anybody off here, but find somebody who actually picks stocks and tells you, where to get in, where to get out, and how to manage the position. See if you could find that. You're not going to find too much of that out there. And it's not easy. It's tough. A lot of people, I have peers that are amazed that I actually do that. It's like, you really do that for those people? It's like, yeah, I enjoy it. This is what I like to do. It's a challenge. I don't do things because they're easy. I do things because they're hard. Anyway, check out the stock course. Big. I think it's a, a very happy with it. Craig's a fan. He he gave me a uh, a testimonial. All right, let's talk about the markets, and then we'll hop into the uh, stocks in just one second. Uh, if you have any stock picks, you can start asking them about them now. If you want to talk about the overall market, you can ask about that now, and we'll hop into the actual charts in just one second. So the question is, 
is it an all clear in the markets? We broke out to new highs just yesterday in the S&P 500. And if you take a look at it from the February lows, it's been a fairly persistent trend up until recently. It kind of went sideways in here. And then it began to take off as of yesterday. Well, I wouldn't call it the all clear, but I have to admit it's getting better. And you just saw the open portfolio. We're way more long than we are short. Now, a lot of those positions are commodity related, which could trade contrary to the other to the overall market. And the one that's not, I think it was NVTR is a symbol on that one, is a very speculative thin IPO. And sometimes these super speculative thin IPO type of stocks can trade contrary to the overall market. They're not worried. The people who trade these stocks are the people who are excited about these stocks. They really don't care about the PE of the S&P 500 or the GDP or anything like that, okay? So it doesn't tend to push these stocks around as much because they just trade. They dance to the beat of a different drummer, okay? So you'll notice with me when the market is sideways or iffy or headed lower, the longs that you're going to see me in or commodities when they're going up, and super speculative issues because it could trade contra or is the word irrespective or whatever. They could ignore the overall market. But, yeah, we are more, more long than we are short right now because we got stopped out of the shorts. And guess what? The database has not produced a lot of shorts. I, uh, a couple of days ago, I'm like, ah, what are we going to talk about this week? And I'm thinking – well, I want to talk about listening to the database and the importance of following what the database says to do. And the reason being is because even though the market looked questionable, I wasn't seeing a lot of shorts. OK, so I didn't put out any new shorts, but I was seeing some new longs come along. No pun intended. And these commodity related areas. And it's kind of like a Steve Winwood trade. See a chance you take it. So I thought those were worthwhile. And then the super speculative IPO comes along, and I thought, meh, that looks pretty good too. Now, let's get back to the overall market. So the point I was trying to make is even though we had this, this iffy market here, we really didn't see a whole lot of shorts from this point forward. Okay, And then luckily, I think the ones that we did, did trigger. And that's the other thing I wanted to kind of mention. It's a combination of listening to the database and then letting the ebb and flow control your portfolio. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. Sometimes it's a so long and things for all a fish situation, which means that you're getting stopped out of the profit. That's okay. Look at the net net move. Somebody emailed me early this week, Dave, I just can't wrap my head around losing these open profits. And, and I thought I would talk about that today too. We just don't have enough time. But just to touch upon that, once you do it long enough, you'll be able to give up open profits because once you get a few huge winners under your belt, and you'll say, yeah, boy, that did hurt in the end. It did suck in the end. But, hey, you know what? That 20% move on my overall account, that 500% move of that stock made it all worthwhile. Now, that doesn't happen every day. And percentage-wise, it's, it's a very small percentage. But it's still possible, and it's what makes everything really work. That's the secret sauce is hanging on longer term. Anyway, boy, I'm all over the place. I apologize. But... Let's get back to this market. So, yeah, if if it's kind of an elephant type of market where, you know, you've seen a little thing about the elephant where, um, you know, it's a tree, a trunk, a rope. Depends on where you stand, okay? I'm not too good at art, being an artist, as you can tell. But the little man, the little blind man feeling up on the elephant. I've got a column just on this. So, yeah, if you're looking at... If you're looking at this, then the market looks pretty good. But sometimes, not to mix too many metaphors, you have to see the forest for the trees. And there's a couple of problems that I'm seeing. One, we still have a mountain of overhead supply. Now, a lot of people confuse me being prudent with being bearish. And they're, they're two different things. i got to be careful about being bearish because... Once you label yourself, you get into a lot of trouble. 
I've just been super duper selective on the long side because it's dangerous to buy in as a general statement into a market that's overbought and running into some overhead supply. So this has me concerned. By the way, and I was talking about this last week or so in the service, and I mentioned it again last night. In markets, one thing that I've, I've learned is that you have to play out several scenarios in your mind. Not that you're going to trade off those scenarios, but you're not surprised when one of those things happens. Okay, And I think, I, I think there's some, some fodder for something from a psychological perspective there. Maybe you guys can help me flesh that out a little bit. But the reason I'm saying this, I'm saying this is, so what could this market do? Well, this market could go on and just blast new highs and keep on going. Well, if it did do that, the one thing that I'm concerned about is if you go all the way back to 2009, this thing is going up and up and up and up and up. I know last year or so has been preaching kind of sideways. But if it did take off again, everybody back here is like, oh, thank goodness. The market's going up again. Everything's fine. So glad I didn't sell my stocks, okay? Everyone who bought it here, it was underwater, which a lot of people did buy late last year. I'm kind of a man on the streets kind of guy, and I get this uh, information from the man on the street. Like, oh, yeah, I'm finally just, I'm just kid, sick of this market going up. I'm starting to invest in it, okay? So you've got a lot of people. A new crop comes along every few years. Markets go up and markets go down. A lot of people, they look at you like you pooed your pants when you say that. Like I often say, it's like when I first went into Starbucks, first time in, I like a cup of coffee. They look at me like I pooed my pants. It's like, you know, I used to have to bring a, one of my daughters with me. Oh, you know, I want some coffee and I want to put some cream in it. I'm sure. All right, Dad, I got this. You know, you want a big one? Yeah, yeah. Venti, up, uh, brewed, rim for cream. I'm like, oh, okay. Can you write that down for me in case I'm not with you? <laughs> in, case I'm, in case I'm traveling the world and have to go into Starbucks, you know? <laughs> anyway, markets do go down sometimes. Markets go down as much as 50%. Markets go down as much as 80%. Now I know hopefully that will never happen again. But in the 20s, the market went down 80%. But I think... 70% is close enough. The NASDAQ went down 70% in 2000. So if you were in a bunch of quote-unquote growth stocks, you lost 70% of your money if you rode that market down. In 2009, the market halfway through, was it 2008? Halfway through 2000, 2008, before bottom in 2009, the market lost over 50% of its value. By the end of the year, it was down, I think, 37 or 39 percent. I forget exactly what, but let's just say 40 percent round numbers. And the average mutual fund was down 40 percent, too. So they just wrote it down, too. OK, I'm not holy than now. I'm wrong more often than I care to admit, although I, I do seem to talk a lot about it here. But at least have some sort of plan in place and some sort of stop in place and realize that the market doesn't always go down. Where the hell are you going with this day? Well, where I'm going with this is that a lot of people have bought in. What's the what's the joke? The hopium has smoked the hopium. <laughs> but they bought in once again to the fact that the market only, go, only goes up. What's fascinating to me is now that I'm becoming an old fart is I've lived through a few of these cycles and I'm starting to see it play out longer term. I wish I, wish I could go back to the old me 30, 40 years ago or whenever it was, maybe about 40 years ago, I guess uh, 20, 30 years ago. I'm old, but I'm not that old. And say, hey, Dave, you know, markets do go up and markets do go down. Don't get too caught up in this um, permanent income hypothesis that it's just going to go up and that you should ride out these huge corrections because they're, quote, unquote, just a correction. So there's a lot of people that smoke the hopium going all the way back to either 2009 or even might be convinced a little bit later in the process when it starts going up again and they start seeing that instant return on their money, or I should say return over like a one year period or so because their financial advisor said, Hey, we're in for long term. And then six months from now, if the market's at new highs, she's going to say, you see, I told you to stick with it. 
I'm in my beginner slides, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm off on a tangent again, but in my beginner slides, I, I came up with a quote that I thought was fairly br brilliant. It's like, so why is this, why is this lie out there that the market always goes up? And my answer to that is it's much easier to be a salesman than a market timer. So I'm kind of proud of that. All right. One other point to point out, we're still under a long term sell signal. This is a weekly S&P 500. This is our bow tie. This is our sell signal. Okay. Last couple times this happened on the sell side, the market lost 50%. Last couple times this happened on the buy side, market went up 100% or more. Okay. Or 200%. Will this one work? I don't know. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Kind of like John McCain used to do. Uh, <laughs> but as I've said before, when it comes to these, these transitional patterns, just like we talked about having to stop up here, not that you want to try to short the P's and ride out all these moves, but until and unless this market goes on to make new highs, this signal remains in effect. Go in and look at gold, bonds, uh, probably rice futures going back to the 1200s in, in Japan, pick any market that topped or bottomed and go in and there'll be a bow tie on the longer term chart or there'll be one of these other transitional patterns such as the first thrust that I'm always talking about. Every top will have a pattern. Not every pattern will turn on the top, but every top will have a pattern. And that's why you need to respect them. So the last 30 years or so, it's worked out really, really well with these weekly bow ties. Let me interview myself. Is it due to be wrong? Yeah. And it might be wrong this time. I, I kind of hope it's wrong and the market just goes up. Life's a lot easier for me when the market just goes up. I don't have to explain shorting to people. I don't have to deal with people. Well, I don't short. You know, it's like, well, there's nothing wrong with not shorting, but just be willing to stick with the methodology because like, well, I don't short, so I'm going to quit. Okay, well, don't quit because you don't know when the next long is going to come along. And then a week later, or so in this particular case I'm thinking of, the reason I'm saying these things is that the next day we had two long set up. Both of them took off, and both of them did really well in spite of the market heading lower. But the point is we still have this major sell signal in effect, and it's still in effect until and unless this high gets taken out. And, again, the reason I brought up those all those other markets is because if you go in and look at them, it's pretty fascinating that it's not necessarily a route. There's nothing magical about this signal like, oh, I've oh, got a signal to go straight down. Sometimes it does, but more often than not, it's it's a pretty bumpy ride. And if you look at those old highs, if those old highs – in many cases, never get taken out. Again, bonds, gold. Look at all the major tops. Those currencies, uh, like the dollar yen, go in and look at all of those major tops and bottoms when you get a chance. And notice that, again, it might not have been a straight ride lower, but a lot of them never did take out their old highs. So that sell signal remains in effect. Now, does this mean we're going to rush out and do a lot of shorting? No, because we're not getting a lot of short signals or many short or any short signals right now. But we're going to be prudent on the long side, and it's going to have to be a pretty darn good-looking setup for us to take a long side setup. And if a good-looking short comes along, we might just take it because the market is not quite all well. Okay? All right. Maybe too much barking squirrel coffee, huh? <laughs> if you do want to follow along for free, you could get on my delayed service. It's not updated every day, but it's somewhere between one to two weeks delay. So I was getting some questions on that day. You're like two or three weeks behind. It's like, yeah, because I don't update it every day. And I also, depending on what's going on market-wise, what I'll do is um, I, I, I increase the lag just in case there's an active signal in there. But it's a good way to actually see the what's going on in the portfolio and follow along. So that way you're not like coming to these weekend charts and think, oh yeah, he just he just picked this, uh, he cherry picked the portfolio to show us. It's like, no, you see the portfolio every day with a little bit of a delay. So the portfolio I just showed a week from now, you're gonna see that 
come up in the service. Anyway, if you can't find it or, or you don't want to type that link in, just go to my homepage, DaveLander.com, and click right here, Getting Started. Okay, click on the bike or click on this little Getting Started, and it's uh, it's there. All right, let's hop into the um, charts. Oh, I just got one more thing. Oh, uh, just a couple more things. I am still rolling out the website, and then uh, I'm still doing this special. Uh, everything is uh, half off if you get, if you get everything, and then you get two hours of my time on that. So that's a great way to really, if you really want to dive in and be prepared to do a lot of work, then uh, check that out. And that's, if you go to my homepage, just click on the fast track. All right, let's hop into the charts. I'm ready to get into the charts. All right, lots of questions coming in. Good, keep them coming. Let's just take a look at the markets real quick. Oh, by the way, uh, this this is AR. I put out a tweet this morning. And this was the one that came within two cents of the profit target. And it came dangerously close at a profit target again today. When it gets this close, it's okay to take partial profit. So go back and look at uh, the weekly charts from a couple weeks ago. That one just happens to be up. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And then let's take a look at uh, some other things. This was a crazy volatile one, too. And the stop was kind of ridiculous. That's in that portfolio. It's, it's taken off nicely today. All right, let's take a look at the P's real quick. I don't want to talk too much about the P's because we just kind of beat the dead horse there. But let's just take a look at the live P's. So yesterday we had a little breakout, and we're getting a little bit of follow through today. So so far so good, but it's only up. It always amazes me. A market just goes straight up. The next day it just kind of barely creeps along. But again, we still have a lot of overhead supply to go to through. Also, the other reason it's dangerous to buy a market at this juncture is that notice this run from lows. That's a pretty serious run. The market's pretty much going straight up. Stalled out recently. But then if you added yesterday's gains plus today's, it's still overbought. I don't know if I just said oversold. I mean, overbought longer term and very dangerous to buy into an overbought market at resistance. And then my other problem that I often talk about is what's called a V-shaped recovery at high levels. And I think I talked about that extensively in the last uh, week of charts. So check that out when you get a chance. But my problem is by the time the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it's going to have a hard time continuing higher. So it's kind of like, it's kind of akin to running a race right after you ran a race. Okay. All right. A uh, couple, let's just take a look at a couple of indices in here. Uh, the, the Rusty and the, the NASDAQ, and then we'll hop into the individual uh, stocks. Keep the stock picks coming. We'll have plenty enough time today. NASDAQ broke out of its little short-term range in here. Not a whole lot of follow-through just yet. It's like last night I was telling everybody to service. It's like, I know you're probably sick of me saying, let's wait and see what happens. And I'm sick of me saying, let's wait and see what happens, okay? So you're not the only one. But as a trend follower, it's what you do. It's like salt and pepper push it. It's what you do. You know, you follow along so a lot of times you have to wait for that follow-through in markets and wait for that confirmation a lot of waiting in this game by the way the Russell 2000 kind of interesting in here like the other to see shorter term but yeah break it out not much follow-through today so far but boy the Russell's kind of scary in here it's got a lot of overhead supply let's take a look at a weekly chart and zoom in on a weekly basis you can go all the way back to 2013, and you could see that it hadn't made a whole lot of progress. And the mountain of overhead supply is amazing there. So to me, this pretty still looks like a pretty serious sell signal and only like a pullback. So it's hard for me to get excited about the overall market while the rusty still looks like this. Okay, it's hard for me to get excited about the overall market while the overall market looks like the overall market. And I guess when I say overall, I mean the, the P's and the and the NASDAQ. But if you take a look at the Rusty, because it's 2,000 stocks, it's a little bit more broad than those other indices. So I, I like to look at the, the Russell 2000, obviously. Um, 
Semiconductors kind of broke out a little bit yesterday, but you back the chart out a little bit. Bigger picture, they're just kind of wide and loose and in this range. Uh, some of these areas like retail have recently broken out, but come back in below their breakout levels. They tried to push higher yesterday, but I just have a hard time buying a market that looks like looks like that, okay? Just, just kind of getting right past this old highs in here. There's a potential for a triple top, one, two, three. Again, we're not trading off that classical technical analysis, but we respect it, okay? All right, let me just look at a couple of more in here. Uh, metals and mining and gold. Uh, still like metals and mining. As you can see, nice little breakout in here. They consolidated for a while, but then they took off. And then also energy is looking pretty darn good. We'll take a look at gold too. Uh, here's gold. Gold's been kind of tough to get on board because gold, it, it's been a little frustrating, admittedly. Because gold went straight up and then it continued higher but with less vigor. It kind of stalled out and then now it's going up again. Ideally, you want this to happen in a market. You want to see some acceleration and not deceleration. It's kind of funny. People who are newer to trading, they, they they give me a stock and they say, hey, what do you think about this? And I tell them what I think about it. And then they Andy me, my brother-in-law's name, Andy. And he asks for your opinion, but then he tells you what your opinion should be if he thinks you're wrong based on his opinion. It's like, why'd you ask me for your opinion? You know, but they Andy me, well, it's going up. And it's like, well, yeah, the market could do whatever it wants to do, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it fits my methodology or the way I think about markets and or the way I think about markets, okay? You asked me what I thought. This is what I think. I think your stock is losing momentum. Yeah, it can go up if it wants to. It can do whatever it wants. But personally, I would avoid it. You asked. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's gold. Gold, the commodity, has been shaping up a little bit in here. It's getting a little – it's kind of a little all over the place, kind of falling today. But in general, maybe let's take a look at a weekly chart. You can see it's kind of bottomed out in here and looking a little bit better. But it's getting hit fairly hard today. It's kind of bouncing around a little bit. All right, let's uh, let's go. Let's uh, hop into the oh, dollar. Take a look at the dollar real quick. UUP. Uh, you can see dollar's been in a pretty serious slide. This is what's helped those uh, commodities along. So... You have to kind of watch everything in markets. By the way, let's take a look at a – let's see if we've got a weekly bow tie here. Yeah, see, this is a weekly chart on the dollar. you got a weekly bow tie, okay? So this would be the high to watch right here. This is what I was trying to explain earlier. Hopefully, I did a good job. But if not, the dollar is topped until and unless it takes out this high. Doesn't mean it's going to be a route lower. Doesn't mean it's going to go straight lower. But according to this chart, the dollar has topped. OK, and a top remains in place in the dollar for now. Write that down. OK. And if it doesn't take out this level here, then a year from now, if it's still hasn't taken it out, then I'll say the top remains in place. <laughs> when my spouse wants my opinion, she gives it to me. <laughs> I didn't know you were married, Phil. <laughs> Okay, Angela says, in all caps, I don't know if he's screaming at me or not, can you comment on the fact that all the portfolio holdings slash percent recent setups are $10 or much less? That is a function of the market, okay? Because if you go look at those, let's see if we can pull it up real quick. If you go look at those, I'm sure he's not yelling. I think his cat's got stuck because I know Angelo. Yes, there are. $10 or less, there's two things that, that are happening. One, right now we're just seeing more speculative issues setting up. And number two, if you look at those, what do we have? Well, most of these are commodity related, right? So let's take a look at that. And it's just an aberration, okay? So this stock is a commodity, this stock is a commodity, this stock is a commodity. This is the speculative, remember I said, aforementioned speculative issue. Now, notice the price on this stock here. I tend to like, as a general statement, I tend to like more efficient stocks on the short side. And as a, as a general statement, 
99% of the time, maybe, the majority of the time, vast majority of the time, I like more inefficient stocks on the long side and slightly more speculative issues within reason. So that's why you will occasionally see something speculative like this NVTR because I feel like even though the overall market is still kind of questionable in here and I'm not a raging bull, then this stock, as I said earlier, might be able to trade contra the overall market. But that stock aside, the rest of the portfolio is all commodity related. Now, what does that have to do with low prices? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at those commodity related areas. Let's take a look at metals and mining. Well, lo and behold, Look what happened to metals and mining. Let's take a look at the weekly chart there, okay? Metals and mining have done what? For a long, long time. Draw your arrow. Go on down. So all of the stocks, or the vast majority of them, based on this index chart, the sector chart, have gone lower. Let's take a look at the energies. What have the energies done? Well, they've gone what? Down for a long, 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 long time. So... What you're seeing is a bit of an aberration because the stocks that are setting up now that I like the most, especially because they can trade contrary to the overall market or commodity related, and they're what? They're lower price. Why? Well, because for the last four or five years or however long it's been, several years at least, they've gone lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. So that's why we're looking at these low price stocks. I don't necessarily go out and say, hey, let's, uh, let's buy stocks that are below $10 a share. Now, I probably could – there's just not enough time in the day, but I know people like that. I think uh, IBD or somebody's like, hottest stocks, less than $10 a share. I see it all over the Internet. You know, Maybe I could run a service and just uh, – because that's – give the people what they want. People want that. I guess people can't afford to buy higher price stocks, so they trade lower price stocks. But there's no reason that we're in lower price stocks on purpose. It's just we do what the market tells us to do, Okay. <laughs> Angelo said, I'm not screaming. <laughs> he says his caps were locked because he was typing a ticker, ORN. All right, let's take a look at ORN for Angelo since he's waited for that one. Uh, yeah, this looks pretty good. you got a nice little bow tie here. One thing that's jumping out at me, though, is uh, let's take a look at the volume on this. The volume is um, kind of light. It's only traded 23,000 shares today, only 100,000 shares on average. As a private trader, absolutely, you can trade this. But – it is going to be a little bit more uh, dangerous and choppy, okay? But I have to admit, it looks pretty good. Uh, nice little bottoming action here. You got a bow tie. But your setup would have been back here, so it's no longer set up. So for me to get excited about it, I would have to go on to make new highs and then play the next pullback. But, again, keep in mind that it's a uh, thin. Donna wants to know about TSLA, TS, TSLA, Tesla. Well, Tesla looks okay. This is another one of those elephant stocks, okay? If you just look at this leg up here, it looks pretty good, but it's getting ready to bump up against these prior highs in here. And this is what, for some reason, I have a lot of trouble getting this point across. But if you're going to trade a stock, I would rather a stock look like look like this, okay? And all the trading is down here somewhere or whatever. Then a stock look like this to where it's got to get past these prior highs and prior peaks in here, okay? If I do trade a stock that looks like this, it has to break out decisively past the prior peak before coming down. Now, don't get me wrong. If a stock is way down here and it's a bottoming pattern like the CNX, CENX, NVTR, pretty much everything in the portfolio – then we're trading a transitional pattern, and that's a different story. So this is something that we're hoping that it gets all the way up here. And if it gets all the way up there, then, man, that's a good problem to have. That's going to be about a 400% ride in CNX, maybe more. I haven't looked at the chart, but I'm thinking longer term, this thing goes back to old highs. Woohoo! I'm in great shape. Okay. All right, let's get through some of these stocks. Biotech, finally turning. Let's take a look at that. Well, here's the IBB, and um, 
I hear you. Uh, the IBB is the uh, NASDAQ biotech fund. Uh, you got a nice little bow tie here. It's sort of triggering that bow tie. Yes, it's bottomed out. looks pretty good. Unfortunately, it does have a lot of overhead supply. So I wouldn't rush out and buy biotech overall. But yeah, I hear you. I think we have a biotech in the portfolio now. Nice show as usual, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Reese. ANAC. There it is. Uh, good volume, biotech. Um, it's not coming off of, I prefer if they were coming off of major, 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 major lows. I hear you. It's coming off of multi-year lows. Kind of crazy longer term. Had this huge gap up. Everybody had to own the stock that it came back down. I hear you. It's trying to bottom out. But just the longer term action in the stock would have me not too excited about it. I look for something else. SA, that's going to be a gold stock, maybe? If memory serves. Yeah, Seabridge Gold. Yeah, and a little bit more pull. Oh, yeah, it looks good now. Okay. Uh, yeah, now if it pulls back to this prior peak in here, I would leave it alone. But as it stands today, it looks pretty good. You'll probably see, based on the action, you'll probably see uh, gold stock recommended today and tonight in the service, I would, I would guess. Rick, that's going to be another one. RIC is going to be another gold stock. Richmond Gold. My daughter is uh, in a stock selection class, and I'm sure she's winning it because uh, I was supposed to – we were supposed to get together on this. I might be admitting some guilt here. Uh, she's winning because I put her in a bunch of a bunch of stocks that were going straight up. Um, yeah. This is not quite set up just yet, but if it's a little bit more knockout move, absolutely, that looks pretty good. And, you know, here's the beauty about this one. Whoever, who brought this up? Uh, good job on this one, or I'm glad you brought it up, I should say, at least. Uh, notice that, let's clean this chart up a little bit. Notice that this stock has acceleration higher. And that's a beautiful thing, okay? That's the, that's the uh, accelerating, what I call the accelerating momentum strategy. And then if you get like a TKO plus some persistency mixed in with that, that's a really good thing. Or an excuse the low volume, no problem. We could look at low volume stocks. Um, yeah, I hear you. But yeah, good, you know, again. <laughs> yeah, I know you're not screaming. Uh, Dorothy wants to look at Netflix. Thanks for waiting patiently. Appreciate that. Um. Netflix is a really huge stock. I'm really not crazy about trading except possibly on the short side. It's kind of crawling back up here. I would just leave it alone. Uh, you know, if you didn't know anything about stocks, you just say, oh, well, where is it now? Let's just draw a horizontal line. So it's been going sideways for over a year. As a momentum guy, I'm not very excited about that. RJ says it's too late for GBT. GBT is going to be another one of those, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of GGB. Um, no, it's not too late. Uh, this is uh, one that I have in my Landry list. I actually kind of wish it would have pulled back a little bit more in here. But, uh, no, I think it's it's the mother of all bottoms, and I think this stock could uh, go up tremendously. Look at the HV, though. It's uh, nearly 100. What did I just say about that? This will require a tremendously wide stop, so just keep that in mind. Mux for Andre. Hey, Andre, how's it going? How's the weather up in New York? I need to get back on those books you sent me. I haven't uh, read them in a while. I need to put them back uh, where they're handy. Uh, yeah, this looks okay. Um, you kind of got that base breakout. It's like, here's the, my only problem with it is I'd like to see a tiny bit more pullback. And unfortunately, if it had a tiny bit more pullback, it'd be back to its breakout levels right here. So I can't argue with it too much, but um, I think it would pass. But it is, it's a good-looking stock, I have to admit. But the problem is, again, I'd like to see a little more pullback. If it pulls back a little bit more, then you're back to your breakout levels on that. Andre wants to know about X. X is going to be a steel stock, biggest of them all, I think. 
Yeah, on a pullback, possibly. Uh, it does have some overhead supply to deal with. I would see if he could find something else in steel. Uh, that might be worthwhile. A lot of them are going higher. Thomas wants to know about HIG. I think that's a gold stock. Nope, that's an insurance stock. Never mind. I must have been looking at HMY. I was right underneath it. Uh, again, you know, you're pushing up. This is a this is a, a nice trending pattern. I hear you, but you're pushing it to this recent peaks in here. And also, there's plenty of speculative stocks out there that are looking pretty good. We we already looked at quite a few today. Notice the HV is about 25 on that. That's a little low given the current conditions and the current uh, setups that we're seeing. Howard says ETE is up to much now. ETE, is it up to much now? ETE, what's that? ETE. Um, well, first thing I'm seeing is a big uh, a big downtrend here. Doesn't mean that it, it might not be bottoming out. HV is 155. That's a little bit on the ridiculous side. But, yeah, I think it's bottoming out. And it could be setting up here soon. You got your bow tie. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. But realize you're up against some ridiculously high um, HIV. Sid, that's going to be another uh, metal stock. That's going to be a foreign metal stock. That's um, Brazil, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of extreme, though. It's It's sort of a little too extreme, too much of a good thing. It went up like 400%. Now it's pulling back. Let's just see how it pulls back, but it's going to have to have a pretty deep pullback. But yeah, we could definitely see some new battles uh, setting up. Somebody's laughing. I don't know what you're laughing at. That's the problem that the questions come in. Uh, yeah, this is too crazy. This is a uh, HV 157. Uh, it gapped higher, went straight up, went from three to eight. It's up 300 percent, 200 percent. Then it came back in. No, that's that's too crazy, even by my standards. And then notice we did back here. It went up 500%. This is just, it's a crapshoot if you were to get into the stock. All-time highs and lows are the best. Multi years are good, but how recent can a higher low be to discount the overhead supply issue? That's kind of a long-winded answer, uh, and that's something that, I mean, not to soft sell you, but that's something that we went into a lot of details in the stock selection. Uh, webinar or our seminar uh, just a couple of things there's no quick answer to that it's kind of like you have to know when you see it but let's say your overhead if your overhead is a hundred percent above where your position is that you're going to take then take it okay you make a hundred percent of a trade that's pretty darn good uh, if it's many years ago, then it might not be as relevant because what happens is people die. Uh, unfortunately, people need to sell stocks for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the market. So if it's way back here, several years back, don't forget about it because markets have long memories. But you could discount it. The further back it is, the more you could discount it. So it could be discounted a little bit. And then also the length of it, if it's very long. It means you've got a lot of people. So those that's the quick answer, and we probably spent 20 minutes on just that alone uh, in the course. So, But that's the quick answer. Okay. Zeus for Mr. RJ. See you. That's a lot of uh, friendly faces in here today. Glad to see you guys and girls. Yeah, kind of thin, uh, super thin, 70,000 on average. I hear you. It's bottomed out. It's rallying. Uh, but in this particular case, it would have to make brand new highs and then pull back. That looks something like that. There's too many good-looking metals and minings out there to settle for. Um, I wouldn't call this mediocrity because it looks pretty good. But this one would have to follow through and then pull back. Facebook for Donald, probably not going to like it. Kind of thick. Yeah. You could notice that. It, it's so funny. People who come to these shows for a while, they can answer the questions for me. Uh, you notice that, yeah, it's worked its way higher, but it hit its old highs, so and now it's kind of rolling back over. Uh, if anything, it could set up as a short soon, but it is kind of wide and loose, a little crazy. Um, not crazy volatile, crazy lack of structure, crazy erratic, L -E -I, crazy um, electrocardiogram. 
Lucas, yeah, we talked about that one. It's all over the place. Um, all right, CDE. Missed the run-up. Do you think it's better to wait until it breaks previous high around 745, wait that pulls back? For Terry, previous consolidation. Uh, CDE. That's going to be a mining stock. Yeah, silver's kind of crazy here. No, I wouldn't. I would let it pull back. The only problem with, with this one is you don't want it to pull it back too far into this prior consolidation. But this prior consolidation is kind of tiny. It's not like a big fat base like we talked about earlier. It's not like a base that looks like this. And then it broke out and it came back in. So, yeah, on a little bit more pullback, I think it could be worth a shot. Absolutely. RH. And you guys have been waiting a while. I'm going to get to you, I promise. I'm going to try to hurry through a few of these. Yeah, this looks like it's bottoming. It's not bottomed just yet. Uh, I'd like to, not that I make this a prerequisite, but when something's bottoming out and has a big gap, I'd like to see the gap closed first. Phil wants to know about Cliff. That's going to be another mining stock. Uh, well, it just kind of barely got past its prior little peak in here. I probably would pass on that one because it needs a pullback. By the time it pulls back, it's going to be back below the prior peak. So I'd pass on that. NVIDIA, NVDA. Uh, no, it looks like it's lost a little steam in here as of late. I hear you. You back the chart out a little bit. Um, but in this particular case, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. Right now, I'm just not too excited about buying a stock at, at new highs in here based on the mag what's going on in the market. Sometimes after a market correction, your, your old leaders become your new leaders and your new leaders become your old leaders. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. But where, where, where are we making money right now? Into commodities. What stocks have been beaten up? The commodities. Okay. AVXS. AVXS. This one's okay. I mean, it's thin. It's an IPO. I'll, I'll give it an okay. Um, I'm having a hard time getting excited about it for some reason, but it looks okay. But let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Kind of too many days in the pullback, but sometimes IPOs can make big picture patterns. It's a little bit more than I want to get into today. Some I, I kind of bend the rules a little bit when it comes to IPOs. If only there was a course on that. <laughs> AUI for Travis. That's going to be another gold stock. Hey, Travis. Uh, yeah, on a pullback. Absolutely. And it's starting to pull back now. I like to see maybe a little bit deeper pullback. Again, we, we kind of have this the, the base problem here, so you don't want to pull all the way back to the base. But yeah, good eye on that one, Travis. I agree. <laughs> F for old time's sake, Phil. Classic, uh, classic Don. Uh, it's just it's all over the place. There's nothing there. Uh, we're. Where are you on using an ETF for metals mining energy? I'm okay with it uh, simply because they tend to be – they're volatile enough. I prefer using an, uh, using the individual stocks because remember earlier we looked at a, a mining stock that, that ran up 50%. Uh, I think you you're, you get a much better move. But these things are pretty volatile like XME and all. Uh, I'm okay with using ETFs for those. Gary wants to know about Twitter, TWTR. Uh, no, draw your arrows. Kind of sideways in here lately. But, yeah, I hear you. It's bottoming, but it's it looks like it's more of a process than an event. So, yeah, if it keeps bottoming out, it might be worthwhile, but it um, looks like it's a process, again, rather than an event. All right, you're welcome. Angelo, good morning, Dave. Another great show. Thank you, John. Checks in the mail. OLED. Um, it's just beginning to break out in here. It would have to break out and keep breaking out because it's going sideways for so long. And then I look to play a pullback. 
And again, I'm not as excited to buy stocks that are at super high levels at this juncture. Uh, let the market prove itself before I start going after stocks in general. Hey, Rock. Oh, you pulled the trigger. Good job, Aaron. All right, fantastic. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been preaching to my people. See, here's the thing. We track things mechanically in a service, but I also try to teach discretion to everyone at the same time. So last week, we were within two cents of the profit target. So I told everybody, look, we're coming into today. Anything above eight is close enough. Feel free to take partial profits. And then it's reversed a little bit in here today. Good job, Aaron. Proud of you. Phil thinks I've capped it. <laughs> no. Let me tell you something. People don't pay that much attention to me. It's like you look at some of my stocks when they trigger, and you can hear crickets chirping. So I'm not – I don't want to ever flatter myself with thinking that I'm big enough to move the markets or have any impact. And here's the thing. I talk to a lot of RIA. I have a lot of RIAs on the service, and they tell me flat out. It's like, Dave, you know, some of these stocks, we just can't, like for the aforementioned reasons, we just can't put them in our clients' portfolios. They, they just don't get it. So what they do with me is they'll take the AROC and put it in their own portfolio but they're not going to put it into a client's portfolio. So they're, they're more, the RIAs I have are really more private trader types that also happen to be running a lot of money. So, uh, and I'm, boy, am I flattered that these people would be, uh, these professionals would, would actually have me on their staff. That's awesome. Uh, Hymex, no, the problem with this guy is that uh, it's been going sideways too much. I mean, it took off, came back in. Uh, you know, when in doubt, draw your sideways arrows on these things. Look at today's close and then look at the close a week ago, a month ago. <laughs> now, nah, Phil, don't read into things. Okay, uh, ANAC. Nice show as usual. Oh, you're welcome. Can we talk about this one? Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, is this one we talked about? Yeah, safe. Yeah, we talked about this one, but it's not coming off of these major, major, major lows. But shorter term, I hear you. Donald wants to talk about CHKP checkpoint. CHKP. Uh, no, that's that's what we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, it's starting to break out to new highs. That's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But it would have to clear those highs decisively. Then we'll play a pullback. Also, take a look at the HV in here. It's 19. Not too exciting. You know, right now we're seeing uh, what's CNX up to now. Let's see. I forget. Uh, the HV is 98 on that one, nearly 100, okay? Coming back in a little bit today. I guess I jinxed it by talking about it. IAG, it's going to be a gold stock. Uh, yeah, it's going to have to pull back, and if it pulls back, it'll be pulling back into the prior base. So I think you can find something else in gold. I'm pretty sure you can. DRD for Andre, that's going to be a driller. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out to do highs, but it's going to have, I'm sorry, it's going to be a gold stock. What am I thinking about in the drillers? There's something there. Uh, it does have some issues back a couple years. I would consider that, but I wouldn't let that turn me completely off in the trade. The problem is it's just beginning to break out from this base and it needs to pull back. And if it pulls back any more, it's going to be back at the base. So I think in gold, you can find something better. Something in between that and something that's going straight up. GSV. Yeah, again, another gold stock just kind of not really getting past its prior peak in here. Uh, look around golds a little bit more. You could probably find something a little better. I would do it for you now, but what's going to happen is I, I know these stocks are going to be on a service tonight and in, in at a courtesy to my peeps. But – you could do that on your own. You could find something that's that's going up. Ruger for RJ. Yeah, these uh, this and uh, Smith are rolling over in here. This looks almost like a short to me. Um, if it was coming off of all-time highs, it didn't have all this trading around here, I would say go after it as a short. But it does look like it's in trouble a little bit in here. But it's kind of sideways, shorter term. I, I'd leave it alone based on all the trading over here and based on the sideways action. But I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. Um, you know, maybe these gun stocks are getting nervous about the administration or something. I don't know. I don't want to confuse the issue with facts. But I noticed that Smith has begun to implode. I helped a couple of you guys with this stock, and, and uh, you took 
profits along the way. So good for you. Um, this was recommended on a service, but it never did uh, trigger before it took off. And then it's been kind of all over the place. So in a way, it's probably good that nothing materialized. Uh, yeah, it still looks like it's in trouble too. Well, we're at uh, right around an hour and a half, and usually that's about the time I have to kind of um, take a break to get uh, make sure the recordings get uh, set. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and not take a break in the show. Uh, anyway, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Again, I appreciate you guys being here. I love these shows, and and uh, it's a highlight of my week, certainly. So, But uh, shoot me an email if you got any, any answered questions. Easy for me to say. And uh, if we don't uh, talk again between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend and hope to see all you guys again uh, next week. <laughs> Smith and Wesson Trigger, go with. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks again. <laughs>